Hello, everyone. My name is Darren Michaels. I am the host of this Scott Labs webinar series where we discuss interesting topics and try and answer questions related to wine, cider, or specialty beverage production. From yeast and nutrients to stabilization and filtration, we dip into the Scott Labs vault of over 80 years of experience to bring you the latest in research and technical applications. Today is about innovation. I've known since I started the wine industry like 20 years ago that Scott Labs and Lalamon were the leaders in innovation. Those are the ones that we typically talked to when I was working before at that time, um, when we talked about ideas for product applications, et cetera. But I didn't know until relatively recently, actually, that there were also the ones to bring the things to market that were new to the wine industry, like wine yeast. Uh, Scott Labs and Lalamon are the reason why we have wine yeast. Uh, that started in 1974. Wine specific enzymes. Uh, we've been working with enzymes that were sourced for from the fruit industry, but actually now, um, but especially now then and now, uh, produced specifically for wine um, um, applications because of color and all this other stuff. It's very important that you source those. And organic nutrients and additives. It's been a while we've been playing in that range. It can be confusing because there's a lot of suppliers in the market out there, but honestly, there's a like new product on the market, there's a good chance that the core research and application processes were driven by departments at Lalamond or Scott Labs, um, to be honest with you. Like for instance, have you heard about Kaidazan? Well, and think that's new? Well, we've been working with Kaidazan for it in wine for at least 12 years, even before it was FDA grass, even before it was used in products or even legal to use in products. We've been doing that for a number of years. Organic nutrients, uh, any nutrients that push wine styles, that's been at least 15 years. In fact, 2002 was when GoFirm was patented. So GoFirm's research is actually driven years before that. Um, and then how, finally, how about non-sac strains? You ever heard of them? Um, probably have. The thing is, we've been offering those for about 20 years. If anybody's ever heard of Promalic, that's a non-saccharomyces strain. When I worked at Vinquery, we were selling it through with Lalamont's help, and that was in 2004, but it was actually two or three years before that. So the research with the non-sac strains dates that point. You know, we were the first to do Tulare Spora. That was years ago, 2006, 2005. I remember trials in Big Prairie, 2004. And then the first with Pro Malik and the latest is with Initia. So Lalamon and Scott have been driving innovations forever. So Today's talk is really trying to help you surf the wave of marketing assertions to help you land on the shore of positive product outcomes. Specifically, Nicola will be opening the toolbox to show you some new tools that are available for clean crafting wines and beverages for distinguishing consumers. Clean crafted is something that's really popping up the last year or two. Always make sure you see, as always, make sure you see the audio settings on the lower left and along the bottom the raise hand and the Q&A buttons. These will be the main channels for communication. And if you have any questions that occur to you during the talk, feel free to post the questions on the Q&A section. We will try and answer the question after the presentation. Your questions will be anonymous. I'll also be looking for raised hands if you'd like to ask any of your questions live. We will also be and are currently recording this webinar. We'll be making it available for for if you want to revisit any topics to discuss or are that have been discussed or if you'd like to forward it to friends that you haven't been part of this thing. Now I've said this before, I'm kind of using this metaphor to the end of time, but I've said this before, it's sometimes in winemaking, it feels like we're herding cats. And in this case, we're trying out some new cat food. So Nicola, please take it away when you get a chance. Thanks, Darren, appreciate it. Well, welcome and thank you for spending your, your morning with us. We greatly appreciate your time. As Dan said, um, we've been driving a lot of innovative research now for decades, but we're a little bit not so good at patting ourselves on the back and coming out and saying, hey, this was the research that we have been part of. And some of you have actually worked with us through the, the commercialization of the research to make sure these things actually do what we say they're going to do, whether they're being used in Chile or South Africa, whether they're being used in Lodi or Napa or Washington or Sonoma counties, it could be Australia, New Zealand. So when we say something, it's, it's, there's so much research behind it so much of what we do goes down to the, the basic characterization. 
we know our organisms, we know our products, we know how we're using them, and it's you that actually takes part in the proof of concept. So we don't do a lot of pure product presentations at Scott Lab, so this is a little different, especially for me. But what I want to share with you today is the science behind our new launch products. Our, our new launch products, um, they get maybe a quarter of a page in the handbook, and it doesn't do them justice. So what I'm going to try to do today is, is do our new products justice. So as Darren said, he will be monitoring the chat and he will be um, making sure that your conversations are heard and that we can answer your questions. So I'm just doing a little bit of screen manipulation here, if you could bear with me. And we're going to chat about I can do what? What new winemaking tools has Scott Laboratories brought to us this year? And kind of what was the science behind them? So as Darren mentioned, Handbook is going to press. So this is a little sneak peek of the Handbook cover by our awesome designer, Alan Just. Um, based on, or his inspiration was Matisse the dance uh, for the, the vines at the bottom. So super excited to bring that to you. So what you'll see when you open the, the handbook this year is eight new products that we're bringing to market. All of the products we bring to market has to have a good application. It's either got to solve a winemaker's problem help them overcome a challenge or allow them to make a certain wine style to meet their consumer demands. Now, our consumer demands are definitely changing. We've got more informed consumers than ever before. And we used to take maybe one or two calls a month about from winemakers that their consumers are asking about gluten-free products, about um, chemical additives that are being used. Are their wines vegan? Now it's becoming almost a daily conversation. And Scott Labs with Lalamand, our parent company, is all about clean crafted beverages. We have been bringing these biological solutions to you from the 70s, and we're going to continue to do so. So let's look at what we're bringing this year. So two new yeast strains, two new Saccharomyces strains, um, a new non-Saccharomyces strain. We're expanding the stimula line of nutrients, as well as some chitosan-based fining agents. Now the chitosan-based fining agents are currently going through TTB approval. So they are not permitted yet, but we're pretty close. Everything's crossed that we will be able to bring them to you by harvest, but we will keep you fully informed of those um, regulatory developments. And we're so excited by what we saw with Glitistar last year and the year before that we're going to highlight it again as a new product because it is super cool. And hopefully if you haven't used it or haven't had any experience with it, that once we get to the end of the Glitistar section, you'll agree it's super cool. Okay, so let's start. When One of our first thoughts when we're, we're making wine, especially aromatic whites and rosés, is the pre-fermentation process. How do I get my, my grapes from the vineyard, through transportation, through destemming, if you're destemming, through pressing it into my fermentation tank without losing any potential quality? So when we, we manage that picking to fermentation well, we're able to preserve that wine quality. If we don't manage it well, then there are risks that we're all aware of. It, the risk could be microbial contamination from the native microflora, the indigenous microflora, could be yeast or bacteria, which can drive up ethyl acetate and volatile acidity. It could be through uh, premature oxidation, or you could even start fermentation a little early. So it's making your, your, your pre-fermentation processes very difficult. 
So these pre-fermentation processes have been traditionally managed by sulfur dioxide. And sulfur dioxide has been a, a fabulous tool for us, and it still is a fabulous tool because it is antimicrobial and antioxidant. Now, consumers are starting to, to ask for SO2 free wines. And as an industry, we actually know a lot about making SO2 free wines that we might not think about, especially if you've been having high pH wine making conversations. SO2 is not particularly effective in high pH situations from an antimicrobial standpoint. So think about what you know and how you can adapt it to current winemaking, okay? So if we are having to, to potentially look at alternatives to SO2, what are those? So what options do we have to reduce the use of SO2 to enhance its efficacy or augment its efficacy? from an antimicrobial standpoint. At Scott Labs, we're not going to come out and say you can completely replace it today. I think that's a little bit arrogant on, so that's why I'm saying, how can you reduce it, enhance it or augment it? It's antimicrobial efficacy. And just as a reminder, the antimicro an antimicrobial is an agent that kills microorganisms or stops their growth. So something that stops their growth is called microstatic and something that kills organisms is microcidal. So the, one of the first things that we spoke to you um, about maybe getting on for six or seven years ago now was the use of non-saccharomyces as a microbial control agent. And we introduced Gaia to you to be used in red grapes or red mass during transportation or to protect the integrity of the fruit, the quality of the fruit during cold soap for up to five days. Because what we realized with Gaia is it can outcompete the native microflora. It can, it stops the growth of Hansenia spora as well as acetic acid bacteria. So the final VE at the end of alcoholic fermentation when we've used Gaia is about 50% less compared to your control with Gaia not used. So this is when we first started talking to you about bioprotectants, the use of Gaia to control the growth of these native, native microflora. And this year we're bringing to you level two initia to round out our non-saccharomyces portfolio, which will include Gaia, Biodiva, Flavia, Lactia, and now Initia. And Initia is able to work like Gaia in the fact it can control native microflora. And if we look in this trial in Chardonnay, before we add any Initia, there was no SO2 added. The microflora is what we would expect to see. We'd expect to see Hansenia spora as well as some other yeast. And, and the ratio can change depending on, on the fruit source, the vineyard practices, etc. But, but if we add in and if we add initia, then we really see the microflora and the microbe, uh, the dynamics uh, changing. So when we look when we added Initia and we had five days of extended juice lease contact at 10 Celsius or 50 Fahrenheit, we'll see that when Initia was present, it completely outcompeted the Hansenia spora. So the Hansenia spora went from 32% to 3%, whereas Initia ended up uh, being responsible for 97% of the microflora. So suppressing that VA control, uh, producing yeast. When Initia wasn't present, well, Hansenia does what Hansenia is going to do, is it's going to start to grow and start to implant and take over from some of the other yeast. So using Initia in the early phases can outcompete the Hansenia spora. So it really is out-competing the indigenous yeast. And by doing so, 
it's acting as a bioprotectant or a biocontrol agent. Okay, so Gaia and Initia are organisms from the genus Mechnicawea. And we have seen time and time again that these organisms can suppress the native microflora. So we have three different Mechnicaweas on offer. We have the Gaia, which is a Mechnicawea fructicola. We have the Initia, which is a Mechnicawea pulsarima. And we have Flavia, which is again a Mechnicawea pulsarima. Now, organisms out with that, so our Lactia, which is a Lachancia, or our Biodiva, which is a Toriolospora, are not really good bioprotectants because they actually have some uh, fermentative capacity. So when you're looking for a bioprotectant, the, the organism you're looking to do that is Mechnicawea, from the genus Mechnicawea. Now, how Initiate and Gaia work to suppress the native microflora is different. So Gaia works through something that we call microbial crowding. It's a uh, well understood and explained uh, phenomena in microbiology. Whereas when you go in with a very large population of one organism, it suppresses other organisms or the other organisms opt out of their growth because they have dictated that they're, um, they're being, the, the phrase I was going to use is not terribly PC. So they're, um, I think it's something, another way to say this. So they're, they're being just outcompeted due to the differences in population numbers. Initia works differently. It's not crowding out and taking up space like Gaia does, it is working through oxygen depletion. Okay, so the native microflora are, are aerobic organisms, they need oxygen. So by taking away one of those key nutrients that the yeast and the acetic acid bacteria need, they are not able to grow in that environment. So we're using two different mechanisms to get the same outcome, which is suppressing the native microflora. So how about SO2's antioxidant capabilities? So remember that SO2 does not directly interact with oxygen. It's rather the reaction products, the transition metals and the phenolic compounds that SO2 interacts with. So SO2 is helping to block the oxidation cascade. So an antioxidant in general is a substance that inhibits oxidation that we have used for years being SO2. So I said that Initia is going to take up the oxygen and take up the oxygen really, really quickly. And we can see that in this graph. When we add our SO2, we add 40 parts per million, or we add Initia, and the oxygen milligrams per liter is 2.5. By the end of the first day, when Initia is present, the oxygen level is non-detected, okay? Whereas when we have SO2 present, the oxygen, the dissolved oxygen at milligrams per liter actually increases to 5.4 and does through over a five day period when it was measured. So Initia rapidly consumes oxygen. So the, the oxygen is not going to be taking place in its, its oxidation reactions. And why Initia consumes oxygen, it's in order to synthesize unsaturated fatty acids. It can't uh, use the phytosterols or other sterols in the grapes, it has to make her own. So she will do so via the oxygen pathway by taking oxygen, but it's the squalene pathway, producing these unsaturated fatty acids, which gives membrane integrity and helps to protect the yeast from um, the damaging effects of, of wine juice being a high pH. 
So the other thing we saw when we looked at Initia being used, and Initia we were looking at it as a bioprotectant, we saw that when no SO2 was used, that the juice browned as to be expected. When SO2 was used, there was less browning in the juice, again, to be expected. But when Initia was used, and um, at the time it wasn't called Initia, it, it's um, R&D code was LCH 1521. When Initia was used in the Sauvignon Blanc, we saw that the wine was, was less brown and it was more on the green yellow side. So that was really interesting because we're like, whoa, this dual effect of Initia having a bioprotectant role and it looks like it actually has some sort of antioxidant protection. So Initia can protect against oxidative browning. We just saw that in Sauvignon Blanc. We can actually measure how well it does to protect against oxidative browning by looking at the absorbance at 420 nanometers. And this time we're looking at in Riesling juice in conjunction with the IFV in France, who we do a lot of work with Vincent Gerbeau there on non-saccharomyces. So in this Riesling, looking at the absorbance at 420 nanometers, we can see that when no SO2 was present, we had an absorbance rate of 0.159. When we added our SO2, okay, the absorbance was lower, 0.149. And remember, the lower the absorbance, the more yellow, so less brown. And we saw that color difference when no SO2 was there and SO2 was added. So we're measuring this. So the lower the absorbance, the, the more yellow, less brown. And with Initia, the absorbance was 0 0.127. So we're seeing an even, uh, much less brown, much more yellow. So we're, we're visually seeing the oxidation protection and we're measuring it through our, our um, absorbance, our basic absorbance readings of 420. So then that should make us think, well then, our aroma preservation should be much better, which it is, okay? We're seeing that when we measure our thiols in our aromatic white varietals that have thiols in them. So Sauvignon Blanc, um, Chenin Blanc, Rieslings, um, Grenache is a red varietal has um, thiols in it. Syrah as a red varietal has thiols in it. So we can see that when no SO2 is added, our actual our 3MH, which is responsible for the tropical and citrus notes, the thiols were preserved from oxidation when Initia was present. Now this is um, our 3MH in nanograms per liter. The sensory threshold for 3MH is about 60 nanograms per liter. So both of them were, were much higher than the sensory threshold, but we are actually preserving them much more with our Initia and our Sauvignon. Seeing a much better protection in our Grenache Rosé. And also similar pattern with our 4MMP, which is giving you that boxwood, gooseberry, rhubarb, that kind of fresh green grassy thyle. We are, the sensor threshold for that is, is round about 0 0.81 uh, nanogram per liter. So we're preserving the freshness as well as the color by using Initia. So that's why we're super excited about it. We're super excited about it because it has a dual role that we've relied on SO2 for, for up to now in the fact that it's an antimicrobial or it has antimicrobial action. It has antioxidant action. So we're preserving our aromas, we're preserving our colors, but it doesn't have any fermentative capability unlike things like Biodiva or Lactea. So it's helping to preserve our wine in the pre-fermentative stages with no early onset of fermentation. So we're going to then use it pre 
fermentation. So we can add it pre-cold settling in whites and rosés, whether you decide to use it in the grapes, in the press, or in the juices that's coming out of the press pan. It really depends on your chemistry when you're going to add it. Because it is a non-saccharomyces yeast, and non-saccharomyces yeast are sensitive to SO2. So if you are using a little bit of SO2, you want to ensure that the free is less than 15 parts. So that might inhibit you and your processing from adding it directly to the grapes. You may be able to add it into the press, but definitely on the safe side, you can add it into the juice because all that SO2, if you have used it, will be bound up by then. It's temperature tolerance, 39 to 68 Fahrenheit, so 4 to 20 Celsius, if you prefer. So it's very compatible with cold settling of juice. Now, what we've said about our non zac for years, when we spoke about them in a spoilage capacity, we, we said that, well, they're, they're little nutrient piggies. They're going to use up a lot of the vitamins and minerals as well as some of the organic nitrogen very early. So you want to make sure that there is enough nutrient there for your non-sac as well as your saccharomyces when you're doing your post initia addition. We all know how to measure yan. We all know how to adapt for yan. So it should be something that's pretty easy to manage. Your non-sac, just as a reminder, do need to be handled a little differently from your Saccharomyces. They are somewhat temperature sensitive. So we're going to rehydrate them at 68 to 86 Fahrenheit, which is 20 to 30 Celsius. So not, not any different than what we're going to do with our Saccharomyces, just the temperature is going to change, okay? So that's why we're super excited about Initia and this is how you use it. Now you'll see in the handbook, I've put 25 grams per hectolitre for the dosage. You can play with the dosage, 10 to 25 grams. It depends on the level of um, Hansenosporin and acetic acid bacteria there. It depends on how long your press cycle is. It depends on how long your settling is. Okay, so if it's going to be, the fruit's going to transfer a very short way, it's going to be pressed really quickly and settled quickly, then your dosage would be lower. If it's traveling a decent distance, it's a big press load, it's a slow press load, or it's a, a large tank settling at warmer temperatures, your dosage will be higher, okay? So we have initia that we can use to enhance, um, reduce or augment the antioxidant effects of SO2. But we also have Glutastar that we introduced to you last year. And Glutastar, you might have seen this picture that um, we put on the website last year. It was Sauvignon Blanc from uh, Yonville. So Glutastar was added, or fruit was, had 20 grams per ton of Cuvée Blanc added, which is a skin contact enzyme. Much shorter skin contact time last year because we, you know, you are a little bit concerned about smoke. Fruit was destemmed. It were, went into the press, and this sample was grabbed from the press pan. The glutastar was added, and this sample was grabbed from the tank once the tank had, had filled and rolled. Okay. So with no glutastar added and with 30 grams per hectoliter added in the juice phase, we see a huge difference in the color. So much more on that yellow green side. So how does Glutastar protect from, from browning? So as, as we know, right, wine is going to be in contact with oxygen. It doesn't matter if it is in the settling tank, if it's in the uh, fermenter when we're adding it, if it's in the barrel, if it's in the bottle. We can get oxygen into the, the, the wine. And oxygen can react with transition metal. So they can react with, with our iron, they can react with copper. And what this reaction is going to do is going to release a, a very simplified level, free radicals. 
and these free radicals are hyperperoxyl radicals and they're think of them as chemical troublemakers right they're just very very reactive compounds uh, once they're formed and in the next step of the reaction these chemical troublemakers these free radicals or uh, hydroxy peroxyls can react with our phenolic compounds. Okay, our phenolic compound has a benzene ring with your oxygen attached. So it's going to react with these phenolic compounds and it can produce these quinones. And quinones themselves are not chemically stable. We say they're electrophilic molecules an electrophile wants to get to stability by accepting electrons from other molecules, okay? So this quinone that's being produced can participate in further reactions um, which, can or, which can result in an alteration of browning wine or it, depending on what they react with, it can stop. This, this browning of wine. So some of the electrophiles, uh, some, excuse me, some of the, the compounds that they can react with, some of these nucleophilic compounds that are going to donate electrons are things that we recognize as being glutathione, sulfides, ascorbic acid, thiols, or other polyphenolics, okay? So that's what happens with the quinone. This um, hydroxyperoxyl or the free radical, the troublemaker, this is what can oxidize um, organic compounds to get aldehydes. Okay, so we've got a couple of things going on there in the oxidation cascade that can result in oxidized wine. And as we know, when our wine oxidizes, it negatively impacts both fruitiness and color. So what can we do to interact with these quinones to stop this oxidation happening? Well, as I mentioned, the quinone is looking to react with something so it can stabilize its, its chemical structure. And one of those molecules or compounds that it interacts with is glutathione. So we say glutathione is a quinone scavenger. Now glutathione on its own in wine ha has a half-life of about five hours. So after five hours, its impact is, is no longer going to be effective because it's no longer there. So glutathione is a super interesting little tripeptide made up of amino acids. So what we can do instead of just using glutathione, which we can't actually do from a regulatory perspective, is we could look at specific yeast that are very rich in glutathione. And these, um, and glutathione in this form will scavenge the quinone, but the half-life is much, much longer than regular glutathione has a half-life of about 80 hours. So it's going to have a much longer staying power to react with these, these quinones that cause a browning, which cause our fruitiness to be dampened. Okay, so using our specific and activated yeast, which is rich in uh, glutathione, gives us a high preservation of varietal thiols and preserves our color. Now, OptiWhite was the first inactivated yeast released on the market 15 years ago that has a glutathione capability. So Glutastar, it contains glutathione, but it's so much more than glutathione. And we know this because one of our super smart scientists that we work with, Florian Bahut, looked at the metabolomics and he did a lot of mass spectroscopy as well. And he was looking at the different molecules that, that were in this specific inactivated yeast. And he looked at, and he kind of categorized them. Are they kind of like lipids? Are they kind of like sugars or the like saccharides? Or are they more peptide-like, similar to glutathione? So what he, he said was, well, 
We've got glutathione there, which is great. It's a quinone trapper, but it's these other peptide-like molecules he was super excited about because some of these other specific peptides are very, very unique to glutastar, and it's these um, peptides that are trapping the free radicals. So, glut so glutastar is super cool because it attacks browning on two fronts. It attacks it by trapping the quinones, but also by trapping these um, free radicals, these hyperoxy or hy the, the, the peroxides that are produced during the oxidation cascade. So it is super exciting um, to be able to bring this biological solution to market, something that is much more um, effective than what we have been using. So replacing SO2 is becoming possible and it, it's becoming possible because of the amazing research that is being done that is coming to us both from the consumer side, they want this, and the research side. So the appropriate tools in our enological tool basket do have to be split up depending on what we're trying to do. Are we trying to look at the antimicrobial replacement? So if so, we're looking at Gaia or Initia. If we're looking at the antioxidant replacement, we're looking at things like Initia, Glutastar, or tannins like FT Blanc, FT Blanc Soft, FT Blanc Citrus, which are gallnut tannins. We can look at our Pure Lease Longevity Plus, which is another inactivated yeast, because we know that when wine is aged on, on healthy yeast leaves, it's fresher, it's brighter. Okay, so we are able to definitely talk about this with much more science behind it. So replacing SO2 is becoming possible. But you cannot neglect your good cellar practices. You have to run your analysis so you know what's going on in your wine so that you are reactive. Uh, SO2 has allowed us to, uh, sorry, so you can be proactive. SO2 has allowed us to be pretty reactive winemakers. So we're having to change our thought and our messaging a little bit. So our new SAC strains that we brought in this year um, have, have, are pretty cool, they're pretty interesting, as are the ones we brought in last year in 2020. Yeah, seems like it was three decades ago. Unfortunately, it wasn't. So we've protected our juice. We've got nice, clean juice to ferment because of our use of Initia, because of our use of Glutastar. So our, our Fermavin SM102 is a pure Esterevisie for semi-sweet and sweet white and rosé wines. Our Lalvin ICV Sun Rose is part of the ICV collection of yeast, which you'll probably be familiar with a lot of them. ICV D254, ICV D47, D21, D80. Well, the Sun Rose is specifically for rosé wine making, and it fits into the ICV, therefore, the Lalmond and Scott portfolio alongside the other ICV strains for rosé wine making, which is ICV Opal, which is to enhance varietal characteristics, and ICV OK, which is for estuary and fruity uh, rosés. The Sun Rose. Um, or I keep on calling it Sun Rosé, it's Sun Rose, is for a rosé that you want to be more red fruit focused, but still with a nice freshness. And last year we, we introduced the Exotics Novello, which is a hybrid yeast between Saccharomyces cerevisiae, where you have your fermentation security, and Saccharomyces cariocanus, which is a, has very in, interesting enzymatic abilities, so it, it makes for very aromatic wines. However, those wines do take a little bit to come into themselves. So they're not for early to market wines. The MSB was a strain from the Lalamand Culture Collection. It stands for Marlborough Sauvignon Blanc. And someone described it to me as making a more of a country club style Sauvignon Blanc. So it's not your fruity, tooty Sauvignon Blanc, but it gives you some beautiful complexity between tropical notes, 
citrus notes, some even stone fruits, and a wonderful balanced mouthfeel with the acidity well integrated. And then we introduce Savi. Savi can be used in both warm climate Sauvignon Blancs or cool climate Sauvignon Blancs with very different outputs. Warm, warm climate Sauvignon Blancs, you get a little bit of freshness there because of its ability to overexpress the enzyme systems that can cleave the 4-MMP, which gives you that gooseberry box tree aromas. In cool climate Sauvignon Blancs, where you might have a lot of those native aromas there, it can be very overpowering. So you can use it as a blending component. So it just depends kind of what you're looking for, but you will definitely be able to produce um, a little bit more freshness in warm climates and super expressed um, green flavors in cool climates. So as I said, the Firma Vin SM1 or 2 is for sweet wines because it naturally stops right around 12% alcohol or it's easy to manage through temperature. The Sun Rose is red fruit focused with a little citrus note to heighten the freshness. And the as it's really for warmer climate rosés where you're looking for those red flavors but also will make a beautiful blending component to heighten the strawberry raspberry notes. So the Stimula range, we've introduced two new Stimula products this year into the Stimula range of nutrients, which all, as well as nourishing the yeast, they really are impacting the yeast secondary metabolism, which allows the yeast to produce aromatic compounds, which are, um, produced during the fermentation stage, or they can release the varietal aroma compounds from their conjugated or non odiferous form so that you can actually smell the, the, the thiols or the terpenes. So the Stimula range, originally we were Stimula Sauvignon Blanc, Stimula Chardonnay. Now we have a Stimula Syrah and a Stimula Cabernet that I'm going to introduce to you. So the Stimula Sauvignon Blanc and Syrah are added at two to three weeks drop. The Cabernet and Chardonnay are added at one third sugar depletion with a standard add rate of 40 grams per hectolitre. So when I spoke to you initially about the Stimula SB, what I said was it allows the yeast to produce enzymes to cleave either the terpene from its, its sugar molecule or the thiol from its amino acid. So remember when these varietal compounds, these thiols and terpenes are in the grape, we can't smell them because of, of how they're bound. So we, when we use our yeast that has the enzymatic ability to cleave these bonds, we heighten our aromatic expression. And what the stimulus Sauvignon Blanc is doing, it's giving the yeast the ability to not only take up these compounds, but to produce the enzymes responsible for the cleaving. So it's helping the yeast um, along with cleaving off the sugars, cleaving off the amino acids that the yeast will utilize and we get these wonderful aromatic wines. So we'll see with the Stimulus Sauvignon Blanc that we increase our 3MH, which is our fruity thiols. We have more of the ester form of the 3MH. So again, more fruitiness, and we increase our, our, our freshness, our grassy thiols. So if we take that and we apply it to, to our red varietal compounds, that have floral notes, that have spicy notes, that have thiols that we recognize as black currant, we can do the same, okay? So this is what Stimulus Sarai is. It's like Stimulus Sauvignon Blanc in the fact that it's an oralized yeast that is utilized at the onset of fermentation, but the precise um, makeup of the oralized yeast is different. 
But what it allows the yeast to do is take up these thiols, these terpenes, these norisoprenoids. So we're increasing our blackcurrant flavors in our thiolic reds. And I know we're used to thinking of thiols in whites, but there's some great thiolic compounds in reds like Syrah, Grenache, Merlot, Malbec, even Cabernet Sauvignon. So if you want to enhance that blackcurrant flavor, then you might look at your stimulus Syrah. It can help with the uptake and the revelation of terpenic molecules. So in that way, we can increase the floral, a lot of the violet notes that are native to things like Syrah, the rosy flavors in Merlots, um, other varietals have these floral notes associated with them like Grenache, Tempranillo, Pinot and Sangiovese. Or we can increase the spiciness. Um, and I call it spicy being a flavor. It's not really a flavor, it's more of a sensation. But we're definitely increasing that in things like Malbec, Syrah, Grenache and Petit Syrah. So what we're really doing with our stimulus is we're optimizing that varietal aromatic potential. Now the stimulus Syrah, because it's specific autolyzed yeast and Lalamond produces the yeast, they characterize the yeast and they know exactly what is in there, okay? Because they produce it. They've got enough calcium pantothene in there to help control a hydrogen sulfide production. So using your stimulus Syrah and your stimulus Sauvignon Blanc, not only do you optimize the varietal characteristic, you decrease your sulfides. What we've also noticed is we have a much better integrated and balanced mouthfeel. And that is feedback that we've had from the users of our stimulus. So again, we're pretty excited about the stimulus Syrah in varietals that include Syrah, but so much more than Syrah. And we can see um, analytically, as well as just sensorily way, that we have an increase in 3MH and the 3MHA. So we can taste it and we can measure it. In this case, it was a South African Syrah. So stimulus Chardonnay was introduced to be added at one third sugar depletion. And that was so that the yeast can take the, the, the nutrient and convert it to esters. So remember your esters are free in floral notes and they are produced by fermentation. The only varietal that we're aware of that has esters naturally is Pinot Noir. Okay, so esters are fermentation derived the majority of the time. And the esters are produced um, all along the fermentation pathway, but there's definitely a switch in ester production right around one third sugar depletion where the esters can go to secondary metabolites rather than primary metabolites for growth. So when we give our yeast amino acids, they transaminate them, they do different things with them to get the nitrogen part they want through the Ehrlich pathway. And we, the yeast is going to produce these specific enzymes, these ATF1 and ATF2, and it's our nitrogen source that's stimulating that, which is allowing us to have much higher acetate, but as well as much higher ethyl ester. So we're increasing our aromatic production of these fruity and floral notes using our stimulus Chardonnay. So stimulus Cabernet does the same thing for red wines. It stimulates fruity ester production. In white wines, it's doing a lot more white and yellow fruits. In red wines, it's producing more red fruits and black fruits. So it's all to do with triggering specific metabolic pathways in the yeast. So we can use our stimuli Cabernet in any red wine that we choose to if we're looking to increase fruitiness. So it can even be used in underripe fruit because what we have seen that we have reduced perceptions of herbaceousness or veggie green characters. In ripe fruit, we are going to increase the fruitiness um, because of these red and black fruity esters that are being produced. And in overripe fruit, so if you're leaving your fruit hanging due to you can't get to it or because it's still a little green, 
you're trying to minimize um, the negative aromas and you're trying to accentuate the positive aromas and, and you're looking for polyphenolic ripeness, then these, these wines can be a little bit more cooked fruit, maybe baked fruit, definitely not as fresh. So using your Stimula Cabernet in that type of fruit will help to integrate the alcohol because they improve mouthfeel, but will also balance those, those jammy cooked flavors, bringing a nice freshness to it. And we can see in this trial that the Stimula Cabernet, this was actually in a Cabernet Sauvignon in Bordeaux, that when we did not add any Stimula, our odor active value, so when we added up the compounds that are all associated with red fruitiness, it was pretty good, it was at 150. But when we added our Stimula Cabernet, we increased our odor, odor active value by 78%. Likewise for the black fruits, all the, the compounds that we, that we know as country, contributing to black fruits, we increased those by 16%. So again, we're tasting it and we're measuring it. So that was to round out the stimula line. We're not finished rounding out the stimula line. So um, more exciting stuff to come. So the last thing I'm going to introduce to you is the alternatives to animal-based finding agents, these chitin derivatives. And this has been something that we have been discussing, as Darren mentioned, since pre since the last decade, or I should say two decades ago, since uh, 2010. Um, they're super exciting. Chitin, chitin is a fascinating molecule. Um, quantitatively, it's second most to cellulose in nature. So it's not something unique, um, but how we're using it is somewhat unique. Okay, so chitin, this is the chitin molecule. It's a biopolymer, so it's a polysaccharide-based compound that we find in the walls of fungus. So yeast is a fungus, so it's very we find it in yeast cells. Yeast will lay down uh, every time a yeast divides it, it will repair that that division uh, scar with chitin, and it's also found in the exoskeletons of shellfish, okay, and crustaceans. In enology, we have to use a specific type of chitin. We are using chitin derived from fungus, and that fungus actually has to be Aspergillus niger. Okay, so no other fungus we can use, and we cannot use crustaceans. But chitin itself is a really super cool molecule, uh, and this is the the subunit, and it can be multiple multiple subunits long, and it has these branched chains. It has these um, amine uh, acetal groups, the CH3, COH group, and it has these amine groups under the acetal group. So what we do is we harvest the chitin from Aspergillus niger, it's actually a byproduct of citric acid fermentations, and we remove that acetal group, okay? And that is how we make chitazan by removing this acetal group. And we'll remove about 50, or we'll remove greater than 50% of the acetal. And depending on how much of this acetal group we remove, we'll completely change the functionality of the molecule. And this is what makes it so diverse. So this deacetylation reaction is going to result and these free amine groups, okay, right along the polysaccharide background. And what that means is that instead of a neutral polysaccharide, we have a highly charged polysaccharide. We end up with a polycationic molecule. And depending on how much of the acetyl groups, we'll have different levels of amines that can react. And that means we'll have different molecular weights, we'll have different ionic charges, we'll have different solubilities. Okay, so when we say chitosan, we're talking about a molecule, but that molecule can be highly diverse. And because of the diversity, it means it can participate in so many different reactions. 
So because it can it's diverse, it can participate in different reactions. We can exploit that to, for its antimicrobial activity, for its use as an antioxidant, or even something like clarification. So let's look super quick at its antimicrobial or what antimicrobial agents we have that are chirazine based. So we have Bactylus and Nobretensine. I spoke about these a lot when we did our um, Taming the Beast webinar this time last year. So Bactylus, I'll use as an example, um, but Nobretensine it goes for this as well. The Chirazan interacts with the molecule. It can interact with the cell wall of the molecule causing um, leakage in the cell wall and the plasma membrane. So what else, how else it can interact with the cells is by forming a little cloud or a little robe around the, the cell wall. So it stops nutrients from getting into the cell. It can bind metal ions, okay? So it can stop the cell from growing, so it can starve the cell out. So three different mechanisms have been proposed for how chirazan interacts with lactics, acetics, as well as Britannomyces. So when we want a chirazan to be antimicrobial, we really need to pay attention to its ionic charge, its molecular weight, and its solubility. That's what makes a good Chirazan with antimicrobial ability. So what makes a good chirazan with antioxidant activity, so NOx, is the degree of deacetylation and its molecular weight. So we're looking for a really long chirazan. So the level of granulometry is important and, and its percentage of deacetylation. So I said that chirazan becomes chirazan when you've removed 50% of the acetyl groups. Well, we're looking to remove even more than that for antioxidant activity, which is what NOx does. And NOx in, uh, protects from oxidation through direct rad radical scavenging, and like we spoke about with glutastar, or through indirectly through the metal ion collation. So we're scavenging that uh, copper, and we're scavenging the iron, so it can't participate in further reactions. So NOx is a replacement for casein, which is animal derived. It's a milk protein. So it is also a potential allergen. It can also replace PVPP in how it works with coloring. So again, looking for allergen free animal free alternatives, NOx can provide that. So last example of how chirazan can work, and this time as a clarification agent, we're going to look at Kiop XC. And our NOx and our Kiop XC are from um, our sister company, the IOC, the Institute of Enology de Champagne. So remember clarification, juice clarification, is a minimum of a three-step process where we reduce the viscosity, generally by using enzymes. Then we cause a flocculation of the particles. So we're using something to bind with the particles to increase its size. And we can do that using Kiopex C. And then we have sedimentation and that happens over time. So a good flocculum that we can use for clarification, you want that to have a real high charge so that you have a very fast flocculation, a very fast adhesion between your finding agent or your flocculant and those things that um, you want to pull out of suspension. So our Kiopex C is very highly charged and we blended it with some tar, tar with tartaric acid so that it can have an even higher charge to promote that very quick flocculation to destabilize the colloids and give us a very fast clarification rate. So that means that the ionic charge is important. So Kiop, Kiopex C 
is our animal-free, allergen-free replacement for gelatins to give us that really fast, fast clarification on the juice side, but also on the wine side, okay? And as we mentioned at the beginning, the current regulatory, regulatory status is chitin glucan from Aspergillus niger is approved for fining. Chitosan from Aspergillus niger is approved for microbial control. Chitosan from Aspergillus niger is currently undergoing experimentation under 24.249 on its way to hopefully being approved for fining. And we're, as I said at the beginning, we're hoping that happens before harvest but we'll keep you up to date on that. But it is one of the innovative solutions that has been requested of us from you, our clients, looking for allergen-free, animal-free products. So we've brought to you, as Darren was saying, these innovative biological solutions now for decades. And we're, we're, we continue this because it is at the heart of our business. Uh, philosophy and looking forward okay what is the future well the future is probably ingredient labeling not today not tomorrow but it will probably come We're, right now the amount of conversations we have on clean crafted beverages and what our consumers mean by that is is um animal free and chemical free additives okay so clean crafted beverages is here and the solutions that we're bringing to you fit right in along with that. And it's not that we've had to change our, our philosophy to do that or change our way of thinking. It's inherent in what, who we are and what we do. And alternative beverages and being part of the Lalaman group and having this amazing research team allow us to bring solutions for alternative beverages to market because they're so well characterized. And if you think of when canning became popular and, and the level of copper was important and the level of SO2 in the final beverage was important, we were actually able to say right there and then, oh, we have products that can replace those, those additives for you that are well researched today. So we're super excited uh, to bring these innovative biological solutions to you or biotechnological solutions, if you will. Um, and we uh, will continue to do so as, as we move forward. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you for your attention. And thank you for, for allowing me to give you a sneak peek of the new products and the, the hardcore science that is behind them. So I'm gonna go back over to you, Don. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so um, I'm reading some of the questions already. Uh, I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. It's kind of it's kind of funny to see, you know, coming from the Scott Lab side now. Um, and, you know, I had known that there was for years we were doing, you know, they were doing stuff, you know, <laughs> out in the marketplace, you hear about it, you know, and then me working with it. I mean, I'm mean, actually most of my experience has been in wineries. So I've been purchasing the products and using them in, in trials forever. So, um, but it wasn't literally until I started to go down the rabbit hole of, of our stuff or this webinar specifically that I kind of really started to drive home and I started to suspect actually that, yeah, we're driving a lot of the vast, a lot I would say the vast majority of research and we're seeing, um, you know, maybe other products come out that are not necessarily commercially available for us from us, but are actually from our data. So it's kind of really interesting for that. So let's, let's pop in because it's already 1206 and I don't want to lose this minute, you know, I don't want to lose, but thank you for that. So i got a question. How do we account for non-SAC inoculation with respect to YAN supplementation? So with non sac, you, you want your yan to be starting above 100 in general. So cover a basis, I normally say 150. You, you will then redetermine your yan just at Saccharomyces addition and compensate for what Saccharomyces needs based on the sugar level and based on the yeast strain that you choose. 
Okay, so non site, you want at least 100. They will consume some, you'll remeasure, and you'll compensate accordingly. So, I, page 44 of the 2020 handbook, I think it'll be 45 of the new one, we walk you through exactly how to determine what your yeast symbol nitrogen should be based on your sugar, based on your yeast strain choice, based on what your current yan is on your fermentation goals. Yeah, so it's something to be aware of, right? I mean, these yeah. strains are, I mean, they are specialized, but they're- but They're well characterized. They're well characterized. Their yeah. metabolism is not gonna be significantly different from strain. Well, no, I take that back. Actually, you and I were talking about this the other day, like to liver spora del brachia, for instance. Mm -hmm. Hey, we're getting to the point now where we have specialized those strains. So for instance, you know, Tellurospora A could be outperformed by Tellurospora B, right? I mean, nowadays, because, and so maybe some of those nutrient demands might be slightly different, you know, make potentially for those non-sac strains, so, right? So, I mean, so just remember like how we, we now appreciate the difference between Saccharomyces cerevisiae. We, we don't even question that they all have unique and specialized capabilities that will draw different things from our wine or give different things to our wine. Non-sac is the same, okay? Just because they're called Torulospora, or if we call them, not call them, if they are, uh, like Metricovia pulsharima, Initia versus Slavia. They're both Initia, uh, they're both uh, pulsharimas, but their actions are different because they're different organisms. They're classified the same because genetically they are similar. It doesn't mean to say they're going, going to act 100% the same. Mm, yeah, okay, that makes sense. Have you done any, have we done any trials or here's the question. Have we done any trials using stimulant products in tandem with each other? For instance, a two, two to three brick, bricks drop and then one of the other ones at one third. Yeah, generally we don't because we're using them to drive a specific wine style. So we'll use the SB or the Syrah. If we're looking to accentuate varietal, the Chardonnay or the Cabernet, if we're looking for esters. So we wouldn't necessarily use them in tandem unless you want wanted to. What we have done uh, quite a lot is looked at the Fermido compared to Stimula SB versus Stimula Cabernet, uh, excuse me, Chardonnay, and things like Pinot Gris or Rieslings and allowed us to make completely different styles of wine. Those three different nutrients within our portfolio gave us three different wines. It just mm. depended what the winemaker preferred. Mm. So speaking of which, I wouldn't use them together, but I would I, I would use use split the lot into two and use them and get get blending options. Has anybody looked at using stimulus syrah for enhancing aromatic spiciness in Barbera? Don't know. Don't know. Try it. <laughs> Can Flavia be used after Initia? It could if, if you choose to. So Initia is going to protect in the pre-fermentative stage, uh, as we were talking. What Flavio, you would add that into the fermenter and 24 hours you'd follow up with your Saccharomyces. And what Flavia does is it can break the bonds that are um, of the varietal compounds. So elevating those, those terpenes and those thiols. So, in other countries, we'll talk about Flavia being bioprotective and we do too a little bit, but because you're adding in the fermenter, you gotta be protecting your wine all the way up to that stage. So yes, you absolutely could use them in tandem because they work differently. Would you use, can you use a non-sac or would, you, would, would a non-sac work on carbonic maceration with whole cluster? That's actually a great question, by the way, because I, uh, um, I'm in the gorge in Washington and there's, we know there's a couple of folks that do carbonic maceration for their, their what do you call it, the, their Nouveau style. Did, what, have you seen that? Um, 
well, if from a technical perspective, if they're going to do what you're looking for, then why wouldn't you? Right? You know, it's probably, yeah, because it's, so it's probably if, fair to, go ahead, mm -hmm. sorry. No, so if you're looking to accentuate the esters, then you would use BioDiva. If you're looking to enhance the freshness, um, then you would do a Lactea. If you wanted to enhance the viral compounds, like we're just talking, you can do Flavia, because there's no reason it wouldn't. Um, it would also, if you want and need that bioprotection, then I might use either Gaia or Initia. So it depends on what you're trying, you know, what your goal is with your carbonic, what you're trying to either protect or accentuate. Yeah, I'm. You know what? What I'm digging on right now is the is the bioprotection to a certain extent. You know what I mean? Like, you know, you and I talked about it. You know, some some bioprotection is afforded by pretty much. There's ones we recommend recommend for specifically bioprotection, but you know, if you have a high fermentation pressure one, that will still you know displace some you know natives. So if you are doing like pure carbonic maceration I, it's always been a struggle with some folks when they deal with spoilage and the way they're doing it which mm -hmm. stimulant would you which stimulant would you recommend for pinot noir depends what you're looking for in pinot do you want more of those black current notes more of the varietal character or are you looking for more esters but as i said the stimuli line will expand so stay tuned and then there was a question we answered, which is, um, is NOOX purely a preventative or can it be used in a curative capacity for oxidized wines? The answer was yes, you can do it for both preventive or if you need to um, curative capacity, but also, you know, so treatment of oxidized wine. But he also, you know, this question also brought up a point, which I, I think I think should be highlighted is that, you know, what, what holds us back a lot of times at Scott is the concern for regulatory impact. And, you know, I get questions a lot, you know, hey, you know, your, your, where's your Kaidazan product or blah, blah, blah. And since we work directly with, with such large uh, product or supply, or sorry, wineries, the, you, the, the concerns of a regulatory um, status is very, very, very present. So I'll oftentimes have to be the bearer of bad news to some folks when they tell me they've been using a product from a different supplier, they've been told by that supplier that it's fully legit and it's not fully legit. So I, I, I'm a little concerned sometimes when we get there, but I think you did a pretty good job of kind of updating folks on that. What I, I do want to steer away though and, and, and really, really emphasize, ultimately the wineries are responsible for the products they add and they really need to work with the regulatory agency directly if they have any questions. Um, Just remember the regulatory agencies, or TTB, approves ingredients, not products. Right. So they do not approve stimuli, they approve autolyzed yeast. So that's why we try to tell you what our products are so that you can navigate the regulations. They will not approve like no bread inside, but they approve Kairosan for that use. You know, it's funny because I just had that conversation with somebody and they were, I'm like, have you looked at the use that it's approved for? And they're like, no, I just thought it was approved. I've been told, I was told it was approved. And I said, <laughs> You know, we really try and help you with this, these kind of things. Um, but, you know, ultimately they're responsible, the wine maker and the, and the wine production facility is responsible for the, what they add. And I really do want to emphasize that with folks is that we can answer some of these questions, but if somebody tells you something's totally approved, not a big issue, um, also verify what it's approved for, right? Like, and how you know, much? And how much, right? So just because something was approved doesn't mean it's approved for, you know, Kaidazan working against Britannomyces, for instance, is a very specific approved use. You know, we're trying to work with winery clients to get some of the other uses approved, but there's a difference between product and approval of usage. 
So I, I really can't emphasize that enough that just because it's approved, Kaizen is approved for Brett, for instance, and you started using it for something else, it's really up to you and the regulatory agencies to kind of hammer that out, you know? Uh, any other questions? Is there any live questions before we close it? Because that's all the questions we have. All right, well, we're well, finishing. I think I'll go and um, put my cat outside now. Sorry for the distractions. <laughs> you know, it's funny because I just did that. I had uh, Rocky Brat. come in here and start meowing at me, and I'm like, you got to get out. <laughs> <laughs> Barely noticeable, but I did appreciate the uh, the comments, the, the commentary from the cat. You know, you got to, you really do have to let him talk sometimes. <laughs> He's like, You're taking away my milk? What? <laughs> well, that's it, guys. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nicola. Thank You're you. You're welcome. Bye. Uh, thank you guys all for the time. I can't stress that enough. If you've got a chance, please submit the sur uh, survey if there is one. <laughs> Our upcoming topics are based in your comments, so please keep them coming. You can email me. You can email somebody at Scott Labs. There's plenty of people to help. If you want, email info at. I mean, it doesn't care. People actually read stuff. And don't hesitate to reach out if any other questions or comments. We believe in continual improvement for the webinars and everything else. So my email is darrenm at scottlab.com, darrenm at scottlab.com. And we posted the webinars on our website. You can just Google Scott Labs webinars. It should show up in the search results. Thank you so much. And all of us at Scott Labs want to wish you and your family's health and happiness. Thank you. <laughs>